screen, right? It was a mistake, do it again. Okay. Uh, so I'd like to begin with thanking the organizers for this uh, awesome op opportunity uh, and uh, for you guys for uh, showing up here. Uh, I'm, uh, whoop, what just happened? Just one second, that's it. Okay. You can see the presentation now, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, I'm very excited to be here and to talk to you guys and to tell you about uh, uh, evasive microalgae and how surface interactions uh, are involved in uh, suspension feeding by ascidian. Uh, so many organisms in aquatic environments feed off uh, suspended particles. We call these organisms uh, suspension feeders and there are in the ocean, there are many, many suspension feeders uh, from uh, uh, microbial suspension feeders, such as this uh, single-celled guanoflagellate, through uh, benthic uh, invertebrates like sponges, bivalves, and ascidians, and uh, some fish that feed off uh, suspended food, food particles. And also this uh, large whale shark can be considered, considered to be a suspension feeders, feeder. And the particle capture mechanisms of these uh, animals are as various and as diverse as they are, uh, from very simple filters to more complicated filters to elaborate paddling system that pinball food particles towards the mouth and digestion. But regardless of the specific uh, particle capture mechanism, uh, our description of those systems uh, is usually similar. We describe them as arrays of small cylinders collecting particles from low velocity flows. Now those cylinders can be the mucus fibers in the acidian filter or the microvilli of the color filters of the guanoflagellate uh, or the theory of the bivalve gills. And the flow can be uh, actively induced by the animal or uh, some animals will uh, uh, take advantage of the environmental flow in order to separate particles from water. And predictions the particle capture of particle capture rate and uh, capture efficiency are usually based uh, on uh, what is called the aerosol filtration theory or hydrosol filtration uh, theory in that context that was introduced into the field of suspension feeding uh, by uh, Rubinstein and one professor, uh, Mimi Cole, uh, among, uh, among others. And the hydrosol filtration theory details the various processes that lead to the encounter of food particles with the collecting cylinders, the collecting fiber. And this is what we see here. This big circle is the collecting uh, fiber or cylinder. And the uh, food particles may encounter uh, the collecting cylinder via different uh, processes. So some food particles will just simply follow a streamline that will bring them close enough so they uh, encounter. Uh, heavier and bigger particles may uh, also cross streamlines uh, and uh, encounter the uh, collecting cylinder uh, due to inertia. Uh, for small particles, uh, diffusion may play a role. Uh, you can also uh, consider gravity in that context and even uh, electrostatic uh, interactions that may uh, attract or repel uh, particles from encountering. Uh, however, uh, in the ocean, we usually neglect electrostatic uh, interactions due to the high ionic strength of seawater. And what's important to understand here is that the most important factor in uh, these processes, these encounter processes is particle size. So particle size dominates this process. And this raises the question, is particle size really the sole predictor for capture? Uh, and we think that the answer is no, and we have several reasons, and one of them uh, comes from an evolutionary standpoint. So you can consider suspension feeders as the predators of marine microbes. And as such, you would expect that through evolution, some evasive microbes will evolve. Uh, and if particle size is the only important factor, the only way to evade uh, predation is to be small, very small. However, there is a theoretical minimum for a free living organism. Uh, and this is because in order to be a free living um, microbe, 
uh, you need at least a minimum amount of DNA, some uh, ribosomes, some uh, cellular machinery to uh, live freely in, in the water. And the smallest cells we know of have the diameter uh, of uh, 100 nano nanometers, the smallest free living cells. And this is what we see here in this image. You see here this crescent shaped uh, bacteria belonging to the star 11 clade and uh, next to this uh, 0.5 micrometer bead. And indeed the small axis of this uh, cell is uh, somewhere around 100 nanometers. And uh, back at uh, 2017, uh, Dr. Dadon Pilosov, who is also a member of our research group, was able to show that uh, SAR-11 bacteria, those smallest free living organisms we know of, uh, are able to avoid being grazed by different suspension feeders, not thanks to their small size, but rather thanks to their surface properties. I had found that uh, they are uh, much less hydrophobic than other microbial prey. Now, this idea that surface interactions play a role in suspension feeding was suggested long ago. Uh, back at 1984, La Barbara wrote that it is assumed that all particles stick. The effect of particle surface properties on capture has been largely ignored. Moving on to 1991, uh, Shimata and Umars wrote that surface characteristics of the collector and particles deserved, deserved much more experimental attention. Uh, then at uh, 2003, Bone et al. wrote that the degree of adhesivity or stickiness must also have a large effect on the capture of particles. Note the ambiguity of these germs, adhesivity and stickiness. And finally, just a few years ago, uh, Conley et al. wrote that the role of particle surface properties in dietary selection in the oceans need to be re-evaluated. And this is what we are trying to do, to re-evaluate uh, uh, the role of particle surface properties in dietary selection. Now, I've complained that uh, the terms used here are ambiguous and I'm keeping on using ambiguous terms. I'm always saying uh, surface properties or surface interactions, those are, are also ambiguous. So I want to try and pour some content into them. And when you talk about uh, uh, the deposition of small particles onto bio biological surfaces, you must mention the classical DLVO theory that was developed uh, and named after the, these uh, esteemed scientists uh, listed here. And this uh, theory, as I said, is often used to explain the deposition of colloids of small particles onto biological surfaces. Uh, and the DLVO theory simply sums the forces that uh, the repulsive and attractive forces that act between the particles and the surface that they deposit on. And this is what we see here in this plot. We see here the force on the vertical axis as a function of the separation distance between the particles and the surface. And here, attractive forces are repulsive and negative uh, uh, forces are uh, attractive. Uh, and you can see that the, uh, this blue curve that represents the repulsive force uh, arising from the effects of the electric double layer, which is uh, uh, which plays a role if the particles and surface carry a similar charge and the attractive forces that arise from the always present van der Waals forces. And if you sum those two uh, curves together, you get this famous green DLVO curve with this uh, energetic barrier here. And what's important uh, to understand here is that uh, the DLVO forces are all the forces that have something to do with surface charge. So surface charge is important. And as I mentioned earlier, in the ocean surface charge is usually neglected. It, it is assumed to be not important because of the high ionic strength of seawater. So we need to expand our uh, surface, uh, our vocabulary of su surface interactions to beyond the DLVO theory to non-DLVO forces. And I want to mention one. Uh, so one surface property I want to talk about is uh, polymer brushes. Polymer brushes are long chain polymers that are attached by one end to the particle surface. Now, if the grafting density of the polymers on the particles is dense enough, the chains uh, will stretch away from the uh, interface. Uh, we're talking about long chain polymers that are tethered to, to the particles at one end and the other end remains dissolved in the uh, solution in seawater in our uh, case. And the thickness of this polymer brush layer, this H, will grow with the molecular weight of the polymer. So 
heavier polymers, larger polymers, uh, thicker polymer brush layers. And polymer brushes give rise to a, to the, to a surface interaction called steric repulsion, the steric repulsion effect. So imagine this polymer brush uh, coated particle that, that is about to deposit on this uh, gray surface, this gray line here. As the particle approaches the surface, the imaginary volume between the particle and the surface, this, this uh, uh, white dashed box here, gets smaller and smaller. And as the volume of this volume, uh, and as the volume decreases, the concentration inside it increases, obviously, which creates osmotic pressure, uh, which uh, leads to a repulsion, a repulsive force. So you can think, think of polymer brushes as the uh, thermodynamic spring powered by entropy. And there are uh, many examples of the involvement of steric repulsion in biology. So we know that some viruses are able to penetrate our, uh, the mucus barriers in our eyes or digestive tract uh, because their capsids are covered with polymer brush, brushes. Uh, we know that the uh, polymer brush will uh, affect the mobility of particles inside hydrogels and biological hydrogels to be specific. Uh, adhesion to mucus is affected by polymer brush and there are more examples. And what's neat about this effect, it's that the chemical composition of polymers doesn't really matter. As long as they are tethered at one end to the particle and are able to be dissolved in the medium, in the solution, uh, you will, uh, 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 and given that the grafting density is high enough, you will get a polymer brush structure and you will get the steric repulsive, uh, repulsive effect. So, we wanted to study surface interaction in suspension feeding, and our approach was uh, as so. We took artificial particles of known sizes, we then modified their surface properties and character characterized them, and then challenged the uh, suspension feeders to catch these particles and uh, measured the capture efficiency of uh, each modified particle. In order to modify our particles, we covered them, we coated them with uh, uh, poloxamers. Poloxamers are a group of uh, long chain non-ionic tri-block copolymers, which means that they are uh, long chain polymers that are made of three block blocks. So poloxamers are, have a hydrophobic polypropylene glycol core and two hydrophilic polyethylene glycol tails. Uh, polyethylene glycol is PEG for short. And we took four uh, kinds of poloxamers uh, with uh, increasingly higher content of PEG, of these hydrophilic tails. So we get five types of particles, particles, our uncoated particles, and then particles with increasingly longer polymer brush or thicker, thicker polymer brush. And what you can see here in these uh, images that were obtained via uh, environmental scanning electron microscopy, an uncoated one micrometer particle. Those are polystyrene particles we use. Uh, and this is uh, the particle after it was coated uh, with poloxamer and you can see this, this uh, rough texture on the surface. So this uh, approach uh, uh, enables us to get uh, particles of several uh, gradients. So first thing, uh, our particles have uh, are increasing in size. So the polymer brush uh, uh, increase, increases the effective size of the uh, particles, the hydrodynamic di diameter. Uh, the second point is that we used uh, carboxylated uh, polystyrene beads and those uh, beads carry a surface charge, a negative charge and uh, coating uh, with poloxamer masks the, uh, this charge. So we also get differences in uh, surface charge. And of course, we uh, uh, were hoping to get uh, an increasing effect of uh, steric repulsion. Uh, we then uh, measured uh, the surface coverage uh, of poloxamer on our uh, particles. We did that by adapting this colorimetric assay that uh, enables us to measure the co uh, concentration of poloxamer. So we took a tube with a poloxamer uh, solution and measured its uh, concentration, then introduced in, uh, into it uh, our uh, uh, beads, uh, and then uh, took a subsample, filtered out the beads and measured again. Uh, and we were able to calculate the adsorption density uh, of poloxamer on the uh, surface. So the number of 
peg tails per nanometer square here of each uh, type of our particles in the horizontal axis. And these numbers uh, correspond to what is known from literature and uh, also, also according to theory should uh, induce a polymer brush and so uh, a steric repulsive, uh, repulsive effect. We then uh, try to characterize uh, the uh, uh, other property, surface properties of uh, our particles. So we measured their uh, contact angle to your right here, uh, which is uh, a way to measure, uh, uh, to quantify hydrophobicity. We created a surface out of our uh, modified particles. We then deposited a drop of water onto this surface and measured the angle between the drop of water and the particle, uh, the, the particle surface. Uh, and we saw that uh, our particles are hydrophobic to begin with. You see that here the uncoated particles have a uh, contact angle of uh, above 120 degrees. Uh, contact angles above 90 degrees are con considered to be uh, hydrophobic. And the coating has slightly increased hy hydrophobicity. We think this is because the, the charge is a mask. We also measured uh, zeta potential uh, as a proxy for surface potential of our particles. Uh, so our particles indeed carry a negative charge uh, or negative potential of minus 25 milli millivolts in, in uh, distilled water. And the uh, coating masked this charge and uh, diminished its uh, mag magnitude to somewhere around minus 10 milli millivolts. So we have our uh, modified particles and we characterize them. Uh, the next step was to challenge uh, suspension feeders to capture these particles. And we chose acidians as our modal uh, filter feeders. And I want to tell you a little bit about the uh, acidians. So acidians are um, benthic filter feeding invertebr invertebrates. They belong to the whole data phylum, just like us. They actively pump water. So you see here in this picture, this is a, a transparent species from a lot. Uh, uh, the acidian will pump water and water will go into the acidian through the, this in, inhalant opening. And the water comes into this organ, this large organ called the branchial basket, where filtration occurred. After the water are filtered, the filtered water will leave the acidian body through the exhalant opening over here. And the uh, particles will be retained on the mucus filter that is draped on the inner side of the branchial basket. And uh, this mucus filter is believed to be this highly organized mesh made out of mucus fibers that have submicron rectangular uh, uh, pores that are very uniform. And we have only few images of this uh, uh, mucus filter. And uh, this one is from the early 80s. And I have a neat little uh, animation I wanna show you just for us to get more details on uh, acidian filter feeders. Feeding, so you see here a cross section in an acidian. This is the inhalant opening. This is, this is, sorry, this is a longitudinal section. This is the exhalant opening. Water will come into uh, the acidian through the inhalant opening into this structure, the branchial basket. The water though, uh, represented here by those blue arrows will then leave through the pores of the branchial basket and out to sea uh, via the uh, excellent opening. Particles, those uh, uh, food particles, those uh, red circles will be retained on the mucus filter that is draped here on the inner side of the branchial basket. This green uh, structure here is called the endostyle, which is a gland that secretes, constantly secretes the mucus. The mucus is then propelled uh, to the other side, to the dorsal side of the branchial basket where it reaches the dorsal lamina, this grating here. At the dorsal lamina, the mucus along with the particles is rolled into a, a string and is drawn, the entire thing is drawn into the digestive tract. So if we take a closer look, now this is a cross section uh, in the, uh, on the branchial basket. The white thing here is the branchial basket. Water comes in from above from the inhalant siphon, gets out via those pores in the branchial basket. Uh, this green uh, structure is the endostyle that secretes the mucus and the mucus travels along the inner side of the branchial basket to the dorsal lamina where it is drawn with the particles into the digestive tract. 
if we take an even closer look, now this is a section at the uh, wall of the branchial uh, basket, we can see that the entire thing is uh, powered by the action of cilia. So we have one set of cilia that lines the pores of the branchial basket that is responsible for pumping the water, and, the, uh, and another set of cilia that faces inwards that propels this mucus conveyor belt from the endostyle here to the dorsal lamina to your right. Okay. So we wanted to measure particle capture efficiency by acidians, and we did that using the INEX method uh, with the vacuum sampling system. And this uh, method allows us to directly sample uh, the inhalant and exhalant water, so water before and after they are filtered. Uh, while we, we're sampling these uh, sample pairs of uh, inhalant and exhalant water, we introduce our surface manipulated particles, and then we can compare the particulate com content of our sample pairs, see what went and see what went in versus what went out of the animal. And here's a short video dem demonstration. You can see here an acidian. This was filmed uh, at 10 meter depth in a lab, and this is it's. A, inhalant opening, here is the exhalant opening, and here I'm injecting some dye to visualize the exhalant jet. And uh, you can see uh, that uh, this uh, sampling system allows us to locate these sampling tubing inside the siphons, inside the, uh, the inhalant and exhalant opening. And these are rather uh, long, some 20, uh, 75 centimeters long, so we can work far away from the animal without disturbing it. Uh, and at the end, those tubings are fitted with hypodermic needles that are used to pierce the septum of vacuum tubes. And uh, we use those vacuum tubes to cleanly collect uh, water before and after filtration, and then we can uh, compare the, uh, how much particles went in versus how much particles went out. Okay, so using the INEX method, we are able to measure the capture efficiency. Uh, here, capture efficiency is defined as the difference between the inhaled and exhaled concentration divided by the inhaled concentration. So when capture e efficiency equals one, it means that all the particles that went to the acidians were captured. If capture efficiency equals zero, it means that none of the particles that went into the acidians uh, were captured. And this is what we see here, the capture efficiency of our uh, five different uh, experimental particles. And you can see that as the thickness of the polymer brush increases, the capture efficiency drops. But this is true up to this point. If we further increase the thickness of polymer brush, the length of the polymer brush, capture efficiency jumps back up, jumps back up, and it's even higher than the uh, capture efficiency of our uncoated particles. And we can speculate that perhaps uh, this is because uh, up until this point where capture efficiency reach, uh, reaches its minimum, uh, steric repulsion plays an important role, uh, enabling the particles more mobility in the mucus and uh, facilitates them their crossing to the downstream side and out to sea. And uh, beyond this point, perhaps the increased diameter starts to uh, be more significant and uh, particles are captured at higher efficiency. So we wanted to uh, look at this phenomena here uh, from another angle, angle and study it a bit, a bit further. So we tried to use a mean square displacement, displacement measurements of particles in the acidian mu mucus. Mean square displacement or MSD uh, for short uh, can help us quantify the, the confinement of uh, particles in uh, mucus, we take uh, fresh mucus uh, that we harvest from acidians, we embed our experimental particles in it, and we put it in the mic microscope, and we let it rest for a bit. Uh, and once the system uh, is uh, at rest, particles will start to, uh, dis uh, to displace due to Brownian motion. They si simply start to diffuse. Uh, and once that's happened, we are recording their location in two dimensions. Uh, two dimensions, we use a confocal microscope over some time, usually uh, 30 seconds. And this is what you can see here. 
you can see uh, the entire tracks of two particles over this 30 second period. And you can clearly see that one particle occupies a larger area than the other particle. Uh, th uh, and we can perhaps say that this coated particle, this poloxamer coated particle is uh, less confined or more mobile in uh, the mucus than the other uncoated particle. If we look at the track of a single particle over time, we can see that the area it occupies increases as time progresses. And this is simply because the particle diffuses away. Now we can calculate this area at each time point and take the ensemble average over many types of many measured particles. And we get the MSD, the mean square displacement. And if we plot the mean square displacement versus the observation time or time scale, we get what is known as the MSD curve. And this is the MSD curve. So we have the MSD, the mean square displacement here in the vertical axis as a function of the time scale. And what's neat about the MSD curve is that its slope is in fact the diffusion coefficient times some constant. Uh, and now this is uh, not entirely true because in our case, since mucus is a viscoelastic material, uh, the particles do not carry, uh, execute an ideal random walk. So they do have some memory of their initial location. Uh, however, since our MSD curves are almost linear or very, very close to be linear, uh, we can uh, define the effective diffusion coefficient as the slope here. And uh, if we look at the effective diffusion coefficient and its relationship with capture efficiency, we see that they correlate really well. So this is what we see here. We see the capture efficiency of our different types of particles as we measure them in situ using the index method as a function of the effective diffusion coefficient. We, uh, which we calculated uh, from the MSD measurements. And you can see that those two parameters correlate really, really well. Uh, and this is a bit obvious maybe because what I'm basically saying here is that particles that are more mobile in the filter will be captured less efficiently, which is intuitive and perhaps obvious. However, it raises the question, does it correspond with the suggested stru structure of the mucus filter as this two dimensional mucus mesh? And we think that the answer is no, that there is a contradiction here. And uh, 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 in order to understand why I need to uh, explain a little bit further about the uh, particle capture by uh, acidians. So if we assume that the acidian filter is this two dimensional rectangular uh, mesh, this blue mesh here, I know that uh, for particle to be, particles to be captured, there are three steps that needs, uh, need to happen. Uh, particles need to encounter with the filter, they need to be retained by it, and the CD need to handle the particles and uh, digest them, etc. cetera. So uh, encounter, uh, particle encounter happens because of the feeding flow, the acidian induces flow, water goes into the branchial basket with uh, food particles and the particles encounter uh, with the filter. Particle retention, uh, requires uh, uh, for small particles, for particles that are smaller than the pores of the filter, uh, the retention requires some retaining force, right? If small particles encounter the mucus fibers of the mesh, they need to be held there by some means. In the absence of this retaining force, those particles will simply roll over the mucus fibers and be lost uh, downstream and out to sea. However, for larger particles, this retaining force is not needed. Larger particles are retained simply by mechanical sieving, just like your pasta strainer uh, at home. You make pasta, you filter it through your strainer and the pasta particles are not lost to your sink because they are too big to pass through the holes. So the same thing uh, should happen here. And this means that large particles, particles that are larger than the pores of the uh, uh, mesh will be captured at 100% efficiency, regardless of their surface properties or color or anything else. Uh, and then a cedian uh, has to handle the particles and digest them, etc. I won't go into that. So large particles are captured at 100% efficiency, regardless of surface properties. 
So we want to check this assumption. Uh, so we measured again capture efficiency of different uh, sized particles. And we have here uh, the capture efficiency as a function of diameter of two types of particles. This uh, yellow curve represent our experimental uncoated polystyrene beads. And you can see that large beads are captured at 100% efficiency, and then capture efficiency drops for smaller particles. And for uh, uh, and the second curve, this green thing represents the capture efficiency of naturally occurring pl planktonic cells. This is the main advantage of measuring in situ. You can see uh, the actual prey. You can measure the actual prey of the uh, organism. And you can see here that uh, naturally occurring plankton is always captured at a lower efficiency than our uh, uh, beads. And this is true for small particles, but it all, it's also true for large eukaryotic algae, such as the, uh, uh, these algae represented by this uh, diamond. Uh, and these uh, eukaryotic microalgae are captured at 70% efficiency in this case, which uh, means that 30% of them were able to cross the mucus filter downstream and out to sea. Now, in order for that to happen, it means that the sphere at the size of roughly three micron need to carry it to cross over this mucus uh, barrier, this mucus mesh. And this uh, illustration is to scale. So it's hard to imagine how uh, su such an al algae will uh, cross this uh, uh, filter. And this simply doesn't fit this description. And uh, we observe this phenomena many times with many different uh, acidian species coming from uh, from uh, several different environments and we saw it in situ and we saw it in the labs there are some exceptions but uh, uh, the vast majority of data uh, uh, shows this phenomena and we think uh, that the possible explanation for it is that the mucus is in fact of a different structure than previously suggested and we think that the, uh, it will be beneficial to think of the acidian filter as a continuous mucus sheet rather than a discrete array of mucus cylinders. So if we look at our acidians and take a cross section here, uh, we get here to the uh, branchial basket and we flatten out this uh, mucus uh, sheet we get here. So this is the mucus filter. Here is the endostyle. The other end is the dorsal lamina where particles are enter the digestive tract and particles will be carried with the flow from the inhalant opening with, with this uh, flux Q, and they will encounter the mucus uh, uh, filter. Uh, and once they encounter it, they will start to uh, transport uh, across it. While they're transporting across it, the mucus conveyor belt, the mucus itself has a velocity carrying the particles from the endostyle towards the dorsal lamina. And we think that we can describe uh, particle capture by acidians as this race between uh, 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 the crossing of the filter to the downstream side and the velocity that the mucus uh, carries the particles towards the dorsal, dorsal lamina where particles will enter the digestive tract and will become an acidian uh, essentially. Uh, so uh, uh, particles that will uh, rapidly diffuse through this uh, uh, mucus uh, filter will be able to escape and particles with lower mobility inside the mucus uh, will be captured. Now, uh, this uh, description is a bit maybe hand wavy, but we do have some uh, evidence to support it. Uh, we took uh, acidians to the microscopy center in the Technion. Uh, we used a method called cryogenic scanning electron mic microscopy, which is considered to be the gold standard in visualizing uh, aqueous soft material. And uh, it's a really cool method where you take your sample, you uh, simply uh, freeze it really, really quickly in liquid ethane. Uh, uh, this causes the sample to freeze and it uh, prevents the water from uh, forming crystals, which uh, preserve the structure of your sample. And uh, that's it. You, and, and you stick it to the microscope and you look at it. Uh, there's no drying involved. There's no gold coating or anything like that. Uh, and when we did that, uh, we saw a structure uh, that uh, looks like a heterogeneous gel or a hydrogel, if you will. And this uh, matrix here, uh, this porous uh, medium is 
very similar to mucus from other sources. So mucus from monkeys, horses, people looks like this and not like this uh, rectangular, uh, highly organized rectangular mesh. What you can see here in this image is the uh, spicules of uh, the species. The, those are very typical of this species of Mania mumus we observed uh, that are embedded inside uh, the, the, this hydrogel-like uh, structure. We were also able to measure its thickness. It's uh, some five microns thick. We then took another species uh, 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 to the microscope. And uh, this time we fed it some beads and you can see the beads here are embedded in this uh, porous hydrogel-like uh, layer. Uh, and uh, I must, but however, I must uh, put a caveat on that. We have too few images. Okay, so this is basically all we have. So we need to uh, uh, keep on working and, and, and establish a, a larger data set of uh, images such as this in order to really uh, drive this point home. So uh, uh, take this with a grain of salt. And uh, uh, I want to conclude. So we learned that uh, surface interactions are indeed involved in particle capture uh, by acidians. We saw that when, when we alter the surface properties of particles, uh, capture efficiency changes as well. Uh, we saw that uh, steric repulsion can lead to a reduced uh, capture if the polymer brush, uh, brushes are not uh, too long or too short. Uh, we saw that surface charge is probably not very important as expected. Uh, and we saw that higher mobility in the mucus from the MSD measurements, we saw that higher mobility leads to lower capture efficiency, is linked to lower capture efficiency. And along with the fact that large microbes are captured less, less efficiently than similarly sized beads, we think that these results are at odds with the accepted mucus mesh model uh, of the tunicate filter. And so thank you everybody for listening and thank you, thank, I wanna thank everyone who was involved in this project and uh, the sponsors and I will be glad to answer any questions. Okay, thanks a lot, Yuval, for, for the talk. It's very nice. Um, so um, there are a couple of questions, actually. Um, I don't know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start. Um, uh, so when you looked at the, when you showed the poloxamer coated particles, um, your SEM uh, showed that um, there are, there seem to be surface inhomogeneities. So um, I was wondering whether you have you guys have thought about potential um, effects due to an inhomogeneous distribution of the polymer brush. So we didn't deal with it uh, directly. The problem is is that uh, these images are extremely hard to to obtain. So it's uh, uh, very difficult to 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 mm -hmm. visualize the polymer brush uh, microscopically. Uh, and in fact, the, our, uh, the rest of the characterization we made like uh, measuring zeta potential and hydrophobicity were mainly aimed at making sure we have a polymer brush around the surface or making sure we have uh, 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 absorption. Uh, and uh, this homogeneity, I don't know how to explain it. And, and, uh, and there's more than meets the eye here. So I think that the most of the polymers are invisible here. Problem is, is that you can't freeze those beads because they'll shatter. So you can't use cryosem and the environmental stem has lo uh, lower, uh, too low of a resolution to see that. And it's, it's people are trying to see uh, polymer brushes, but it's pretty hard. The, okay. the only way currently is, is atomic fault microscopy, which we should at some point do. Okay, thanks. Um, I think there was a question from Matea Santiago. Hi, yeah. So I thought that the um, the slide that you had showing the difference um, in the capture efficiency of all of the different, so way, way back in the beginning, I should have made a note of which, um, which this slide, one? yes, this one. Yeah, so um, I was interested in, well, I think you explained it, but maybe I didn't understand there seems to be this slope down from as you increase um, and then all of a sudden there's a bump up, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it seems larger 
than the than the smallest. I was wondering if um, how significant this is and how robust you've been able to see this. The difference between those two data. Yeah. Yeah, it is significant. Uh, okay. Well, it's not big. Yeah, that that's my question because there's a little bit of overlap. So I was just yeah. wondering um, how significant uh, you can attribute this to. Yeah. So so yeah, we, we did statistically test it, and and, and those are do, those two are the same, and then there are differences between all the rest. Oh, cool. Very cool. Thank you for answering next, my question. Yeah. Next one from Kirash Samsami. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. I was just wondering, uh, you showed the plot uh, where with the comparing capture efficiency of uh, beads with the same size uh, planktons, right? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, uh, is it possible or have you thought of uh, using non-motile planktons? Uh, um, because you were kind of maybe thinking that the difference might be because the plankton is motile moving around on that surface. Is it possible to use non-motile to maybe rule out or actually prove that thing or I don't know. So so what we, we measured here are, are just the plankton that uh, were uh, naturally occurred in the seawater. You know, we didn't, yeah. we don't, so these were, were uh, measurements uh, uh, that were conducted underwater. Uh, however, what uh, Ayelet, uh, Dr. Dadon Philosophu, I mentioned earlier, uh, is doing, she takes these uh, INEX samples, these samples of water before and after uh, filtration, and she ex extracts uh, the DNA and she sequences it. She's, she's using next generation sequencing so she can tell which um, uh, um, microbes are captured and which are not. Uh, and uh, she's, she did it with uh, uh, focusing on bacteria using the 16S uh, small subunit, ribosomal subunit. And now she's uh, trying to that with with uh, eukaryotes. So and 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 one of the main questions we we want to address using this method is is the question of mobility because it it it, it should play a role. We think it might. Uh, it perhaps you can uh, imagine that some uh, uh, motile uh, plankton will be able to power swim through the mucus and and uh, tear the way their way out. Uh, and yeah, we're, we're definitely interested uh, in that. Yeah, thanks very much. Hi, welcome. Okay, um, is there any other question? Um, I, had, I had actually, um, this like a silly question. This looks like um, very much like the uh, mucus transport in the lungs. Um, so is there, any evolutionary uh, uh, link between the two? You yeah, think? so acidians are, are the closest uh, invertebrates relatives to us. Uh, so, uh, 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 and the branchial basket is in fact the uh, precursor, if you will, of, of, of the gills and later on the lungs. So, so probably the endostyle uh, this gland that secretes the mucus is is uh, um, is parallel to the thyroid gland. Uh, so uh, so I think the answer is yes, kind of. Okay, thanks. Um, Ray. Yes, I I have a question about. So what do you think about the uh, photo from uh, 1981? I mean, what do you think there is if it's not this? This photo here. Yeah. So, so I'm not. Maybe I should clarify this. This uh, I'm not trying to refute the existence of the of this uh, mesh there. It was observed several times, uh, three times by three different uh, scientists. Uh, you, uh, they all use the same method, though, of critical point drying. Uh, and uh, gold coating uh, of dry, uh, they observed dry sample. What I think is that the mucus is a, a hydrogel and when you dry it, it collapses and you uh, are left with, with 
perhaps the, the uh, like reinforced concrete when you have the, the, the uh, iron rods inside the concrete to make it uh, stronger. So I think this is perhaps uh, uh, there and the, that the role of this uh, stuff is, is to, to help with uh, mechanically fortifying the mucus so it won't be uh, teared apart and, and, and will be lost. And, and, but, and additionally, when, when, when you expect to see a filter, you expect to see a rectangular mesh and you take many, many observations of uh, or microscopic observations of your samples, you publish usually some of them and you will publish those that will fit your expectations. So I'm, I'm not sure, and I'm not trying to, to be provo provocative or anything else, but I'm not sure that that this structure is really the entire structure throughout this uh, uh, huge organ, the branchial basket. Most of these images come from very, very close to the endostyle. Uh, this is where you get these kind of images from sample close to the endostyle. So it might be that the mucus is secreted this way and then something happens and become, becomes more uh, 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 heterogeneous. So this, but this is complete speculation, so I, I don't know. Okay, thanks. Um, is there any other question? Um, if not, I'm going to stop.